Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Nima Abuwarde. Now, as football fever hits the world, the heat is on to pull in the punters. But what is it that keeps the crowds coming back for more? We'll be finding out how one firm is keeping its customers cool in a giant igloo on the beach. Also coming up this week, looking ahead with 2030 vision, can Bahrain pull off its ambitious plans for economic reform? Out with the new and in with the old. Why Alain is pushing for world heritage status. And a date with destiny. I find out what it takes to transform a date into a delicacy. But first, it seems that every country here in the Gulf has a 5, 10 or 20 year plan. Now these are ambitious projects to modernize their societies and economies and they mostly involve moving away from oil and gas. But the Kingdom of Bahrain is doing things rather differently. It wants to ramp up production, as Philip Hampshire found out when he went to the capital, Manama. For the Middle East, this well in Bahrain is a historic location. It's the site of the first in the region to strike oil. So this is oil well number one. It was first put in in 1931 and struck oil in 1932. But in all the time since then, they haven't found another onshore oil field. And that's a problem. Bahrain's government relies on oil for 80% of its revenue. So you'll find drilling rigs springing up across the country because even as reserves fall, they want to raise production to pay for their Vision 2030. Ironically, a plan designed to reduce dependence on oil. Bahrain has got the human resources. With a main oil field nearly 80 years old, I asked Bahrain's oil and gas minister how it's possible to raise production higher. Because now technology is available, which is called enhanced oil recovery, and we want to see how much we can increase the production from the Bahrain field because we know we have enough reserves. And they will be increasing our crude production threefold. So currently it is around 32,000 barrels a day. In five years it will be double that, and two years after that, which is in seven years, it will be 100,000 barrels per day. So what is being done with this money to prepare the country for the eventual rundown of oil and gas? One push is assisting entrepreneurs like Hassan Haider, who started up an online DVD rental company. I'm actually quite supportive of the Vision 2030 because what it does, it, it unites both the government and the private sector towards a common sort of goal, a vision. Uh, the leadership of Bahrain have been quite uh, active in promoting the Vision 2030 in all aspects of Bahraini society. One of the aspects of the vision is to help, help uh, spur entrepreneurship and develop small businesses in an SME sector. So that's really something that's close to my heart and to see that as part of the vision of the great leadership, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Aside from loans, grants and new laws, the Vision 2030 includes plans for Bahrainization, the process of replacing skilled foreign workers with Bahraini nationals, people like aircraft maintenance personnel. The process of baronization all sounds very good in theory, but in practice it relies on the fact that the people you're moving into the jobs all have to have the skills necessary in order to be able to do them. Otherwise, the whole system falls apart. And that's part of what this project here does around the back of Manama Airport. They're training up the next generation of aircraft engineers by taking the cream of those leaving school and giving them vocational training. I love the aircraft. That's why I enjoy when I work everything uh, related to the aircraft. Uh, this is uh, something uh, great to have uh, this uh, workshop to doing my work until I go to my own job training with uh, some com uh, company. Uh, this is beautiful <laughs> or something amazing. But what do the country's leading CEOs and businessmen make of the plan? Uh, the economy itself is very liberal. The people are very cultured uh, and, and, and developed. They're, they're business minded um, uh, and therefore it's natural for, for Bahrain to desire developing all of these excellent facets that it has um, towards developing the country itself in the future. 
And why would a smart Bahraini who could get a safe job in government want the stress and risk attached to working in the private sector or for themselves? No, 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 that's, that's not for me. Um, I need to be challenged in my career. I need to have problems with I can, which I can think about. I need to activate this. Um, if I don't, then I'm just kind of useless and just lying around. I, I might as well just go live on the streets. Um, I have more. I have a passion for something. It all means Bahrain's economy is getting prepared for a prosperous and long life, just like the nation's favorite tourist attraction, the thriving 400-year-old tree of life. Philip Hampshire reporting there. Well, the man responsible for Bahrain's Vision 2030 is Sheikh Mohammed bin Isa Al Khalifa. So 18 months into the project, how does he believe it's being received by the government and people? The people of Bahrain are starting to unite around it. I mean, and the example is if you open a newspaper on any given day, you will see references to 2030 on the first page. So, it's, it's becoming part of our lingua franca or part of our everyday discussion and I must say we're, we're very pleased with the progress. Part of the Vision 2030 is to help diversify the economy away from oil but you're also planning on drilling more oil wells over the course of the next few years. So is there an inherent contradiction in this? Uh, not at all. I mean um, uh, we, are, uh, we are today a very well diversified economy. Um, we are the most diversified economy in the Gulf, in fact. Uh, but what we must continue to do is to invest in all areas. So although we want to reduce our dependency on oil uh, and become a globally competitive economy, um, I think it is incumbent on us to continue to develop whatever we have. But 80% of government revenue still come from oil. Isn't that a problem? Well, th there are two things. One is um, the oil sector has very little impact on the economy and everyday lives. Employment in the oil and gas sector is 1% of total employment. Um, it is only 13%, 1-3% um, of the economy, of GDP. It is the third largest sector. Um, so in, in terms of impact of everyday lives, we've, we've come a long way. Um, with regard to government revenue, Yes, it is still a, a large part, and the government has a plan to gradually reduce this uh, uh, dependency on, on, on oil as well. So I've got to ask you, what's next? We are cautiously optimistic. Um, we, we're forecasting uh, a 4 to 5 percent growth this year and increasing uh, even more next year. Bahrain's Sheikh Mohammed bin Isa Al Khalifa speaking to Philip Hampshire there. Now, in a country that seems all too ready to pave over its past, one city here in the UAE wants to preserve what's left. Al Ain in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi has applied for a place on the United Nations list of World Heritage Sites. It's keen to show off its archaeological sites, its old fort and oases. But what does the city stand to gain? Well, Katie Watson went there to find out. At 46 degrees, collecting dates is hot work. This farm is tucked away inside a walled oasis in the centre of Al Ain. There are lots more oases like these, which is how the city got its nickname of the Garden City of the UAE. It also means you won't find any skyscrapers being built here. The weekend retreat for the ruling Sheikh Khalifa, it's a sharp contrast to the buzz of Dubai and Abu Dhabi. The city's history is unique too. For the past 4,000 years, it's been a bustling trading hub. And crucial to this is its location, right on the border with Oman. It's this, according to local historian Hassan al Nabuda, that helped put Alain on the map. Uh, caravans, they used to come from east uh, to the west of Arabia. They stop here in Alain with the goods being imported from the east and exported to the west. Uh, El Ain has a lot of water at that time. That is why it was very important. Uh, and water was very important at that time for people uh, living in this part of the world. The importance of water in Al Ain, which is surrounded by desert, meant that the commodity was fiercely protected. That's why, dotted around the city, are forts built by rival tribes to protect their resources. The battle for water may now be over, but the forts remain as a constant reminder of its past. It's this past that the Emirate of Abu Dhabi wants to preserve. For the past three years, Abu Dhabi Culture and Heritage has been putting together its application for Alain's historic sites and surrounding natural areas to be recognized as a World Heritage Site. 
It's a painstaking process, but the forts and oases are considered an important part of the city's heritage, and they want to maintain that. There are 890 World Heritage Sites across the globe, and the list is compiled by the United Nations Culture and Science Body, UNESCO. Some of the most famous sites include India's Taj Mahal, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and the Great Wall of China. And if Arlene's submission is successful, it'll become the first World Heritage Site in the United Arab Emirates. Cultural recognition would help Abu Dhabi's efforts to promote another side to the Emirate. It's known more for being oil rich rather than culturally rich, but Abu Dhabi wants to change this perception. Uh, it's very important for looking ahead. Uh, everybody knows that uh, the resources of the oil are not uh, permanent, they're perishable. And because there's this constant sense of uh, uh, finding the ways to survive into the future and doing it in a successful manner, it's very important to diversify, diversify the economy and culture will play a significant role in that. And it's not just the Emirate that will benefit. This market is run by local women in Alain. They're keen to attract more people to visit their stalls. They can promote all things out uh, for the people uh, to come to buy uh, my things from my, uh, from my country. In Abu Dhabi and Dubai, you see like uh, big malls and uh, it's uh, really hard to reach the, the local uh, people directly and their businesses. Uh, but in Al Ain, uh, you can reach them easily and uh, uh, everyone will be benefited. The hope of more tourists is an attractive prospect, but will being a World Heritage Site be enough to encourage people to Al Ain and put it on the world cultural map? Some experts think more needs to be done. UNESCO, yes, adds a lot of quality uh, in terms of culture to the destination, but uh, tourists just don't go there for just the UNESCO heritage site. It's like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. You've got to include Sydney, you've got to include Melbourne, it's like the Taj Mahal in India. You've got to include Rajasthan, the state, you've got to include Delhi, and then that becomes the entire complete destination. So Alain's got to be marketed along with Dubai, along with Fujairah, along with Sharjah, along with Dubai, along with Abu Dhabi, and that becomes a complete package. It's these landscapes that the authorities are hoping will convince UNESCO to make Alain a World Heritage Site. The application is now in and being considered, but there will be a few more sunsets like this one before they know whether they make the grade. Katie Watson in a line there. Right, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, heading out for a date. I learn how to spot the pick of the bunch from the experts. And World Cup cash in, how firms here are getting in on the action. <laughs> Welcome back to the programme. I'm Nima Abuarte. Now, it's been a staple food of the Middle East for centuries, but the humble date has many guises, from dusty market stalls to high-end boutiques. Some dates sell for pennies, others for pounds. So what is it that sets them apart? Well, in the first of a special series, I go to one firm to find out how they make dates into delicacies. OK, here in uh, Dubai, we um, do a central production. We get a date from Saudi Arabia, all the raw material, different kind of date, nearly 20, 25 uh, kind of date. Um, we bring from our farm, uh, in, it's clean in the farm, and we receive every week nearly 24 tons uh, to be used uh, in, produ in production and dispatched to our shop. Okay, okay, these are the kinds of data. This is all the different variety of the date. We have nearly 20, 25, and the size of the date. So which is the best date? For me, if you ask me, I will recommend the Kulas. Uh, it's a yellow date, uh, well known in uh, GCC country, soft, toffee taste, and um, very easy to combine with uh, almond, caramelized pecan. So you're going to show us how you do it now? Yes, in production. Uh, this is a Kulas date. This is my, like my favorite date. We receive from our farm. We remove the seed. We had any garnish. Today is a caramelized pecan and we coat it in chocolate to adjust the size. And after the coating, we rub in the chocolate. Can I try? Of course. OK, here we go. So just one at a time. Please, do do? Oh, please in oh, that oh, way. Oh, yes, okay. no, no problem. This is more easy to go through the chocolate. So now what are we doing? We're putting this. The decoration. It means what we put on the top, that will show, I, I tell you what is inside. Ah, oh, 
Exactly. In a, in, a, in, a, in a display, you will see six or seven types of uh, date chocolate. But to recognize the flavor, you will put a decoration on the top. Don't touch with the chocolate, yes, because after, know. everything stick, stick on your finger. Am I doing a good job here? Very good. You can put a little bit more, but it's okay. So far, so good. You can stay, I think, for another week. Lina, let me help you, because we are a little bit late. We need to put a pancake before the chocolate set. That will not stick to the date. There we go. Back up to speed again. Exactly. Come back on track. Voila. After five or seven minutes in cooling tunnel, all the cho dark chocolate is very really good color, mm -hmm. shine, and uh, ready to pack. And again, everything is done by hand. Everything and is done nothing by hand. We cannot do by machine, please. Voila. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another one. Now, uh, you see, Nina, some, some dates are, are not good to sell in the, in the bottle shop. Mm. You know, some damage, some... Uh, this is not up to standard. Mm. Means that that date will live on a belt, and that will go direct to the, to the bin on a, on a, at the end of the belt. Now we're ready for action, we're all gloved up. What happens here? Hello, here, this is a stuff date, okay? Means uh, we get a date again from Saudi. We remove the seed, okay? So these are the seeds? This is the seed, we remove the seed, mm. and uh, we put back the date on a belt, and the, two, the last two people put the garnish on a date. And uh, today you're stuffing with almonds? Today we're stuffing with the roast almond. Fantastic. Now, I, of course, I would like to try my hand at this. Of course, you can do. So I just take the date, yes. stuff it. And you press a little bit. Ah, I press a little bit. Okay. Yes, you press a little bit. Mm -hmm. And also don't put straight on the bottom because you will not see anything. Yes, just voila. Ah, finish oh, perfect, okay, number fantastic. one now. Yeah, after half a turn I'll remember, yeah. right. So this is the last thing we do. Get the box. And you and want how much? What, 500, yeah. 500 grams gone. per box. Nearly there? Yeah, a little bit more, yeah. Oh. Allez, uh -huh. One more. One more. Perfect. Great. And we can close now. And we will go to the ribbon. Now, show me your magic. Okay, um, you do one and I'll, I'll copy you. So I get the ribbon, I go like this, and then we go back under. So it's like learning how to tie your shoelaces again, you know. All right, and then. Oh, I did it. Yeah, now we have 2,000 to do today. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Atal. This is something I made for you earlier in your factory, and this is where it all ends up. What is it about dates in this part of the world? Uh, date has always been part of the culture of this um, uh, part of the region. Uh, uh, but before Batil came along, um, dates were always sold as a commodity in soups and, and supermarkets, and nobody thought of it as a um, gourmet product, as an alternative to um, luxury chocolate that comes from Europe. Uh, we created an entirely new market producing dates of a quality that competes with gourmet chocolates and other products. To do that, we had to do two things. One, we had to elevate the quality of dates, uh, and there, to do that, we had to invest uh, in new technology in farming and processing. And secondly, once we produced high quality uh, dates, uh, the production cost was high, so we couldn't sell it in through the existing distribution channel, so we created a new marketing channel by introducing the Batil boutiques. Where is your growth? Is it mirroring the global economy? No. So Asia is better for you? Now what we want to do, our growth is based on moving out of the Middle East, where 80% of our business comes, but it's a small part of the world market, and, and grow, uh, grow in uh, the Far East and Europe. I think I'd better stick to the day job. Now, the Middle East's only representative at this year's World Cup is Algeria, but that hasn't deterred fans and businesses here from getting in on the action. In fact, just behind me, a whole new building has been put up specially for the occasion. So, in the 45-degree heat, fans can head inside into an igloo and watch the games on the biggest screen in the country. But with every pub and bar showing the games, will their investment pay off? We thought we had to do something uniquely different. We, we knew that with the venue that we had here being largely an outdoor venue, we couldn't, we couldn't just put the screens up and expect people would come. We had to, we had to, to create something that was, if you like, the wow effect. Um, and if you look around town, there are some very, very good World Cup venues. Uh, and, and, and from what I understand, those venues are doing very well. Did you feel that there was a lot of pressure on you to do something totally different, to try and get the crowds to come here instead of going somewhere else? It has been... Uh, very much part of Barasti's psyche over the last 10 years because we, we, we started as, this, this particular outlet started as a porter cabin on the beach. 
And we've now grown into what is arguably the largest and busiest bar venue in Dubai. The feedback we're getting on the converse to the question, we are getting a lot of positive feedback from the industry as well, from others in the industry coming here and saying, well, you've, you've set the bar and we need to, to in future follow. But when you say our business model, doesn't that depend on who wins which game? Of course there's risk, there's always risk and there's, uh, you know, there, there is a risk here, but from what we've seen over the first four days, the numbers that we're seeing, even for the, for the, for the minnows of world soccer, um, you know, the numbers we're pushing through our, uh, through our bar and through the venue, I, I, I'd be very surprised if we didn't make, uh, make our numbers that we've projected. So what's the atmosphere like here? Really depends on who, uh, depends on who's playing. Last night was Brazil and North Korea. Well. We didn't have many North Koreans here, but uh, we certainly had a lot of Brazilian supporters. It is like being in a stadium. It's like being at the match. I think that somebody would have thought of putting up a structure, an air-conditioned environment over the summer months before now. Do you regret not doing it earlier? We would never have done this last summer. We wouldn't have been able to do it with the, the, the slowdown in the, in, in the economy. Uh, you know, as everyone was, we were watching our, uh, our, our costs. But uh, I think what we've learned is that there is a market for this moving forward. On, uh, on Thursday night I was, I was talking to one of those partners and they asked if they were to invest in this particular structure, would we put it here every year through summer? Of course, naturally. And there you have it, an igloo on the beach. Well, our time is very nearly up. I do hope you've enjoyed our program this week. Before we go, let's see how the region's main markets finish the week. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Now, next week, we're joking around in Jeddah. But in a country where cinemas and theatres are banned, can stand-up comedy break barriers? Until then, from me, Nima Abuwarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>